One of the things that I figured out, or thought I figured out, I'm always very uh, careful about saying these things because I'm so aware that every theory is just a theory, that even my own I have sort of a distanced relationship to a fond, but distance one to. What I figured out is that with each stage there is a shift in perspective. So just to give you the diagram, see how it evolves from opportunist to diplomat to expert to achiever to individualist. Each time there is a new center and the star basically is the center. And what's the object or the O or the other is what you can look at. And as you can see, the object gets bigger and bigger. The greater, the farther away I can stand and look at, at things, the more of the world becomes object. And the more I can influence it, have choices about it. So it's about self-awareness and the position I can take towards my own experience. The very first stage we're going to talk about is the opportunist. And we don't talk about the earlier in this context because really people at earlier stages don't appear in the working world. They're so uh, undeveloped in some ways. They're more like children. They need full protection. They're often institutionalized or stay with a family at home. They're not in the working world except in the most minimal way. What's important about that, and you have quite a bit of material, both from the HBR article that Torbert and Rook wrote, and from other handouts that you will have uh, about the specific things. The opportunist is in some ways similar to what Spiral Dynamics describes as red. Um, it is self-centered. It's out to protect the self. And there are two forms of that. There is the aggressive form of that, often male, but not always. And there is the self-protective way of that. If I can go out and conquer everybody and, you know, beat them into submission, well, if, if I'm weak and small and I live in this dangerous world, the jungle out there, then I become self-protective. Everything I do is about protecting the little I have, protecting my survival in this harsh environment. Um, I used, in, because we don't have that much time, I use the mottos that are sort of typical for that stage. If you just read them, it's a jungle out there, me against everybody else. My way or no way, have you ever heard that one? Might makes right, you better watch out. And to get as much as one can, why one can, I win, you lose, and it's not my fault, because the opportunist really doesn't have a, a sense yet of the self over time. They don't even have something you could describe as a self other than their physical here and now and their capacity, um, they do not have a sense of guilt or responsibility. They, they don't look ahead, they don't think things through, they do whatever impulsively, whatever seems uh, instrumental at the time. And when you encounter them at work, well, does anybody have somebody they would describe in, in sort of that fashion that they know? How do you have to deal with them? How do you have to handle them? What skillful means to handle an opportunist? Speak up. Set very clear boundaries, yes. And? Yes, frame things in terms of what they can get out of it. And sometimes you have to be the alpha male, woman or man. You have to really first establish that you're in power. And unless they, you know, follow your role, dreadful things are going to happen to them. So that is often very difficult for people who are the 
middle and later stages because their love and kindness and understanding are so deeply valued that being, that being strong and having male compassion is just very difficult. It seems like an inner conflict. How can I be strong and maybe even harsh or decisive here when that's not what I believe will actually save the world? But it is necessary. And the capacity to do so is usually a sign of somebody who is quite well developed. If they can do that by choice, and one of the main distinguishers between all the stages is how much choice do I have in my behavior and how much is how I behave an automatic response. The later the stage, the more choice I have. The more I'm aware and the more I can either behave this way or that way or another way or not behave at all, stay still. Oh, okay, let's go to the next one. Because I'm introducing the stages, but I will also show you a joke. And th the reason for that is that to me, the joke often points out the shadow of a particular stage. So just imagine for a second, you were an opportunist. What a tough world. Whatever you do, you have to watch out. Because there's always somebody else who wants what you have, or who is stronger or who in other ways is trying to get something from you. So it's a, it's a tough life, it's a struggle. In the best of cases in the business world, if you have a nose for opportunity, sometimes opportunists have that. It's like almost a visceral capacity because they're not intellectually sophisticated in that sense. They're not going through their mind, they're going through their survival and body awareness. They can sense opportunities and go after them. And that might be if, it, if somebody like that is well placed in an organization, that might actually be a useful thing to have. But it has to be carefully managed. The next stage is the first what we call adult stage. And it used to be when Lovinger did her work, there was maybe 30% of people tested at this stage. Now we don't, I don't find more than 10%. And she did her work just around or just before the big consciousness raising of women happened in the, in the 60s. And that shift was even somewhere else. But this is the sort of the traditional role that people played if you uh, enter a new organization, it's not a bad place to play. The diplomat, the person who kind of keeps, listens, tries to follow the culture, tries to follow in, in, in dress and other ways, sort of what others do if the culture is one where you come in in jeans, then you dress in jeans, even if you came in your previous job, everybody was dressed up. It's the kind of behavior that tries to please, that tries to get accepted. Because again, wisely, if you are at the later stage, but you want to get accepted in a new place, it's not a bad idea to use your diplomat capacity by choice to sort of first fit in, lis listen. Uh, the diplomat that is diplomat fully, where that is his or her center of gravity, has found a new kind of power, namely, rather than me against the whole world, it's now us against them. And the, the additional power by having an us is really quite amazing, the shift from that singly me against them to this. Um, so you have to tribe, you have the family, you have whatever group you identify so closely that not being part of that is really jeopardizing your well-being. So the diplomat will do anything he or she can to fit, to be accepted. And they're also the ones that because they're so skilled at trying to be liked and to smooth things out, they're the ones in a company that are the, the we sometimes call them the social glue. They're the ones who remember birthdays of others. They're the ones who know who has a bad day and will respond to that. And that's where they really feel happiest at doing that kind of work.
And of course, anybody who is slightly different is seen as not right. There's the enemy. If you're not with us, you're against us, is one of the mottos of the, the diplomat. Can you think of other mottos? Don't rock the boat. What about these two? Why are we laughing if we are? As I mentioned, they show somewhat the shadow side of the diplomat. The diplomat really has no wherewithal to adjudicate opposing sentiments and to be uh, to, to, to call a spade a spade. They will always try to see the good thing and never say anything that could get flack or feed pushback. So by saying, like, uh, the dog there, oh my, everybody mentioned would make a great president, he basically up, abdicates his responsibility to make a choice, which is something we expect of adults the capacity to do that, to evaluate different presidential candidates and then say, this one I want because for these and these and these reasons, the diplomat will tend to try not to make decision to follow in the best sense of the word. If you give him a task that he can execute the she and follow, they'll be happier than if you say, hey, show some initiative here. And often in businesses, that's what we do as diplomats. Unless we recognize their strengths, we tend to want to move everybody like an achiever. And that's very, very difficult for the diplomat to, to show initiative because then you stand out. And loyalty, of course, is a major value at that stage. Standing up for those that are your group, whatever the group may be. And the comfort with hierarchical system where there is a boss and a boss above that that you can follow and you would never jump the ladder. You would always go just to your boss if you have a complaint, if at all, if, if you're not just meekly and trying to you know, do your best given the circumstance. That changes with the next stage. It's called uh, abstract operations by Piaget. It is the first time in life that somebody actually can step outside and look at their own behavior, their own self from a other perspective. So here you're the diplomat, you're completely, your identity is basically the identity of those you're with. You don't even have a separate identity. It's completely confounded and confused with the identity of the group that you belong with. Then you step out and you look back at that group and say, oh no, I'm special. I can see what I, how I'm different from you, from, the, from you all. And I want this recognized.